Hola a todos, muy, muy buenas tardes. Eh, sean muy bienvenidos a esta, este nuevo encuentro, esta vez eh, internacional. Tenemos la fortuna de contar con nosotros, con el doctor Donald Brum. Eh, esta oportunidad se ha dado en un marco muy importante en Chile. Eh, la charla sobre sintiencia animal creo que es no solamente importante en Chile, sino que a nivel mundial. Y para nosotros como Comisión eh, de Bienestar eh, Animal del de Consejo Regional Metropolitano, del cual yo soy, además de encargada de comunicaciones, parte del directorio, nos complace realmente haber tenido esta gran oportunidad eh, de eh, contar con una eminencia de este nivel eh, en esta charla. Así que aprovechemos, eh, les explico más o menos la dinámica, ya hay más de 180 personas conectadas, eh, la conexión es automática, es decir, ustedes entran y automáticamente eh, van a estar en la sala, la sala no les permite ni video ni audio, pero sí está abierta la, el icono de preguntas y respuestas que está como Q and A, ese icono es el que nosotros vamos a ocupar para leer sus preguntas. Y por favor, que sea ahí y no en el chat, donde ustedes planteen cualquier duda eh, que le quieran hacer al doctor Brum. Por un tema de tiempo, estas, eh, vamos a seleccionar alguna de estas eh, preguntas y bueno, las demás se eh, quedarán como para una próxima oportunidad y veremos si el doctor Brum podría responderle a, a los que hayan tenido alguna, alguna pregunta. Eh, sin más, eh, voy a dejar con ustedes al doctor Hernán Cañón para que eh, sea el quien presente formalmente al doctor Brum. Nuevamente agradecerles a todos su asistencia. Recuerden ocupar el icono Q&A, preguntas y respuestas. Y esta charla en todo caso va a quedar grabada para que todos ustedes puedan volver a verla y los que no quedaron o no pudieron entrar también puedan acceder a ella. Los dejamos entonces muy agradecidos de parte del Consejo Regional Metropolitano. Bienvenidos a todos ustedes acá en Chile y Latinoamérica. Muchas gracias eh, Alicia, eh, muchas eh, gracias a todos también por esta participación y esta bienvenida. Yo voy a hablar muy brevemente, introducir um, un poco la historia del de, de profesor Donald Blum. Él es eh, profesor emérito del Departamento de Medicina Veterinaria de la Universidad de Cambridge. Yo tuve la suerte de poder estar con él durante mi doctorado. Eh, un, un, una gran persona. Y, y también fue mi mentor durante todo, durante todo el doctorado, así que le tengo mucho cariño, eh, estoy muy contento de poder eh, recibirlo eh, a través de Zoom eh, para esta charla tan importante sobre sintiencia animal. El profesor Brum eh, es el, se considera el padre del, del bienestar animal, del concepto moderno de bienestar animal. Cuando uno revisa <coughs> quienes, quienes, han más, quien, quienes han publicado más en, en bienestar animal y han hecho grandes avances en este sentido, eh, Donald es, eh, es, 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 el, es la persona. Eh, y en ese sentido, bueno, él tiene más de 180 publicaciones y tiene más de 15 eh, libros publicados en diferentes idiomas, por lo tanto lo coloca como, como la persona que realmente eh, sabe más de bienestar animal eh, en el mundo actualmente. Y el tema que nos convoca hoy día tiene que ver justamente con eh, un, una parte del bienestar animal que es la sintiencia animal, eh, en esta charla Don probablemente va a mostrar todo lo que eh, son los conceptos y definiciones de sintiencia animal eh, que son muy importantes siempre el tema de las definiciones y conceptos eh, son muy importantes para poder entender en realidad y en profundidad el tema eh, ¿por qué? porque toca justamente temas de ética, de moral de sentimientos y emociones que pueden tener los animales, de la conciencia animal también y también, y no deja de ser tampoco cierto, la sintiencia animal eh, toca temas eh, y, y, y afecta temas sobre la sustentabilidad de sistemas productivos animales. Eh, sin más, eh, dejo a Don para que comience su charla. Eh, agradezco nuevamente a Don, no, no tengo la cámara prendida, Don, disculpa, eh, 
no, algún, algo, me, algo me pasó con la cámara, no, no, no me deja, pero agradezco tu presencia y estaremos en contacto. Muchas gracias. Don, please. You can start your presentation. Thank you. Yes, okay. So, uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Hernan, and uh, it's very nice to be able to uh, speak to everybody here. Uh, and uh, I, I've, I've had so many uh, very enjoyable visits to Chile, and it's good to uh, be able to talk to you. So, I'm going to talk about sentience, and I'm going to talk about how uh, attitudes to uh, non human animals have changed. And I think these changes have been uh, quite uh, significant, and that we have. I'm trying to make the slide go forward, but it doesn't move. So. Uh, let's try again. Right, it's not moving the slide. Okay, and then it moved it. Okay, uh, so there have been changes in uh, attitudes to what is an ethical thing to do in relation to the animals which we use. Uh, there, there has been a view that humans are at the apex of a pyramid and all of Don, the, yes, Don, sorry, but your presentation is not in a screen. It is not shared. So, sorry, not shared. No. Oh, okay. Can you do it again, please? Yes. Thank you. I'll start again. Thank you very much. Um, I can try. Yeah. Wait a minute. I'm going back to share. So it, I thought it was shared before, but uh, now I'm sharing it again. Yeah, it's can perfect now. It? I, yes, we can see it. Yes, it's very, okay. very, it's okay. Right. You can see that? Yeah, it's okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, the idea that uh, everything leads to humans, this idea is now uh, has changed a bit. And it's part of a number of changes which have occurred in science as we have learned uh, some new things and it changes uh, ideas. And in a lot of the changes have been that the similarities between humans and non-human animals are uh, very often being demonstrated by the, uh, uh, the more we learn, the more similar we find that human and other, uh, other species are. Um, of course, humans have some abilities that are better than in certain other species, but uh, there are other species which are better than humans in some ways as well. And this is associated with a, a change in the attitudes of people. And when you do surveys of people and you say, do you think the lives of other species of animals are important? Do you think that the welfare of animals is something important in your life? Does it affect what you, what you will purchase and what you will not purchase? Then more people now would say, yes, it's, uh, the welfare of animals is very important. And so this may come from a survey, a quite e extensive surveys like the Eurobarometer surveys in the European Union, but you get similar results in most countries. Uh, and the, we have an increase in the range of animals which are considered to be the subjects of moral concern. Um, what, uh, uh, an, an example of a change in, in our biological knowledge, which is changing how we speak about a lot of different animals is that it is now clear that every at every stage of gene expression during the development of any individual organism humans included that the environment has an effect at every single stage of gene expression and that really has been a, a, a come about from work in in the last few years especially so of course all the characteristics of humans and of other organisms are affected by genetics, but nothing is independent of the environment. So we actually need to change some of the ways in which we say things because there is nothing which is completely genetically determined. Everything is affected to some extent by the environment. And so it isn't right to say that uh, 
any kind of characteristic is, is instinctive or innate. Uh, nothing is completely independent of the environment. So that's just an example where the, our knowledge in the last five to 10 years has changed that thinking. So what are these concepts, uh, which we uh, I'm going to talk principally about, about uh, welfare and health and stress and sentience. And we have uh, a, a general view now, these ideas of one health and one welfare that these words mean the same thing for humans and for non-humans. It isn't, a, isn't something, stress means the same thing if you are talking about a fish or you are talking about a human. And the mechanisms are very similar, not identical, but similar. So we actually should use words in the same way for humans and for other species. And an example of that is the word euthanasia. And so euthanasia, if, if you were talking about humans, and you, uh, people may or may not agree that euthanasia is something which is ever acceptable for humans, but I would say that what it means is killing an individual for the benefit of that individual and doing it in a humane way without causing pain and suffering. So that's what it means when we talk about humans, and it should mean the same thing if we are talking about non-humans. So if you uh, say, well, I, 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 am, I'm not, uh, I don't like my pet dog anymore, I'm going to kill it. That is not killing it for its own benefit. And so that is not euthanasia. And um, similarly, if there is a laboratory animal or a farm animal which is being killed, then that is, uh, is not euthanasia if it's not for the benefit of that individual. I hope it would be humane killing, but it isn't euthanasia. So overall, then, there is only one biology is the general message. Uh, or, or, and the, a, lot, a very high proportion of the biological processes which occur in humans also occur in other species. And of course, we depend on that because for, for, uh, in that we use lots of other species in laboratories as a model for humans. So these things actually should be changing our attitudes. Uh, and we, of course, we need laws to control our interactions with non-human animals. We need laws to preserve the world environment. And when I say the world environment, that's not just the environment that humans use. We should be preserving the whole environment, even if it uh, isn't something of great significance in human life. But overall, I would say that one of the problems that have, uh, uh, exists in the world at the moment is that humans are too centered on our own species and uh, it would be better if we were thinking more widely about what should happen. Now, animal welfare. So the welfare of an individual is its state as regards its attempts to cope with its environment. Uh, we and all other animals, humans and other animals, have uh, very many different coping mechanisms, physiological, behavioral, these involve the brain in almost all uh, aspects. Uh, so there are a lot of feelings, positive and negative feelings, which are part of coping mechanisms. And of course, there are responses to pathology, uh, which, are, which are an important part of, the, of coping with the world. So these, there, are, there are lots of different uh, aspects of animal welfare. Uh, in English, we have two words, welfare and well-being, but they basically mean the same things. Uh, most scientists use the word welfare. And I think it's important uh, that now sustainability is an important topic for uh, most people, and welfare is a key aspect of sustainability. If you have a, a system which involves uh, farm animals, for example, then many people would say, well, the most important part of the sustainability of this farming system is the welfare of the animals, or they would say at least welfare is something of importance. And what we ought to be doing with sustainability is we should be using scientific scoring systems, taking account of all the different components of sustainability. Uh, health is a key part of welfare. So welfare is quite a wide term. And health is not something which is separate from uh, welfare, it is, it is a part of welfare. And health then is 
that part of the state of the individual which is to do with pathology, attempts to cope with pathology. And we have a, ninth, a, a definition of the World Health Organization going back to 1940 something, and it's out of date now because it's before we started using the word welfare. So we, we, we need to know what is going on in relation to the health of individuals to identify sickness, malaise. We need to uh, assess poor health, of course, as a, as a key part of understanding welfare. So welfare then is a characteristic of an individual animal. And that's different from animal protection. And protection is a human activity, but welfare is a characteristic of, the, of an animal. Uh, quality of life means basically the same thing as welfare, but we don't use quality of life for a very short time scale. But you can assess quality of life. It's exactly the same measures that are used for assessing welfare. Hmm. And we have a range of laws which refer to animals and they tend to distinguish some animals uh, which are, are to be protected more than others. And these are in the European Union, in the, in the treaty of the underlying aspect of all of the legislation in the European Union, it says that the animals which we use are sentient beings and we ought to take account of that. So which animals should be protected then? Well, if you are keeping an animal, then most people would say you have some duty to care for that animal. And maybe sentient animals should have more protection or, that, or at least different protection. So what is sentience? Sentience means having the capacity, having the awareness and cognitive ability, which is necessary in order to have feelings. And so animals are sentient if they have this capacity. Uh, what, what are the abilities which are needed to have this? Well, sentient beings then have abilities to evaluate the actions of others in relation to themselves, to remember their actions, to remember the consequences of their actions, to be able to assess risks and assess benefits, and to have some degree of awareness. So this term sentience, a, a, a particular kind of animal, is either sentient or it is not sentient. So we have to evaluate uh, whether the there is evidence that the individual has this capacity to have feelings. So which animals are sentient? Well, the first part of this question is which people are sentient? Uh, supposing you consider a newborn baby or supposing you consider a fertilized egg, is that a sentient being? Well, very clearly uh, the, the Fertilized egg is not a sentient being because it doesn't have the ca capacity to have feelings. So during the development of a human embryo or a human fetus or during the development of any other uh, mammal or, or, or bird or fish or uh, during their development, there is a point when they have, when these capabilities uh, may appear. And so not all, during development, humans are not sentient at the beginning and then they become sentient. And the same would apply to our farm animals and laboratory animals. Also, if uh, an individual has damage to the brain so that they do not have this capability to have feelings, then they are no longer sentient. So there are humans who have such damage to the brain who are not sentient. And of course, there are animals of other species which are like that as well. That might be because of that damage, maybe because of an injury or because of pathology, it may be because of uh, extreme dementia. Uh, so there are humans who are not sentient. And when we talk about sentience, we need to consider development and brain function. Well, there's been a great deal of recent research on cognitive ability and feelings in non-human animals. And so I'm going to say something about that because uh, there, th this, this is the area where there's been quite a lot of change in knowledge recently. So here, is, here are a few examples of cognitive ability and also feelings in a, a range of different animals. Um, the, these are some studies done with members of the crow family, birds, and these birds in the, uh, and the, the species studied by Nikki Clayton and her group in Cambridge are, are jays, so a member of this family of birds. And these birds, hide food and then they go back and find it later. 
Sometimes they go back many weeks or many months later and they find the food which they have hidden. If they hide something like a peanut, then they may leave it for months before they go back again. But if they hide an, a mealworm, the larva of an insect, then they will uh, come back again in a short time. And obviously this mealworm would, would, uh, would, would decay and therefore would be of no use if they left it for some weeks or months. So that means they have a, a concept of what is going to happen to that mealworm in the future. Uh, they, are, they are acting in a way which is different from the way they would act with something which does not decay. Another thing which they do is if they hide food and another bird is watching them, they will very often come back very quickly afterwards and hide it somewhere else because otherwise it may be stolen. Here's another kind of example, awareness of numbers. Uh, this is a study which was done by Olga Smirnova, and uh, what she did was to train crows, uh, again birds of this same family, to respond to the number of dots on an object, and the numbers were between one and eight. Uh, they were shown an object and then they had to respond to another object, and they were able to distinguish the number of dots between one and eight. And then after they had learned this, the crows were trained to respond to the symbol which we use for numbers, the Arabic numeral, uh, one to eight. And they were able to respond to that and to translate the number, the number of dots to the, the, the number itself, the symbol, and the other way around. Also, if they were shown two dots and five dots, they could correctly respond to seven dots. So they were able to add uh, these, these numbers together. And if they were shown the numerals, number two and number five, they could respond to the number seven. So this is an awareness of numbers and of the concept of addition. Some of that sort of work has also been done with parrots. Uh, Irene Pepperberg in Brandeis University in the USA has done work with African gray parrots. Parrots are very useful things for humans to study because they can make words they can say words which are recognizable for humans. And the, uh, uh, one of the parrots was able to use words for 50 different objects. So if you say, uh, what is it? Uh, the, the parrot could say, it is a blue ball, or there are three green balls, and could use it for the name of the object, for, the cut, for colors, for shapes, and quantities from one to six. So again, you can see there are a lot of concepts here which these birds have. And actually in English, we sometimes in the past used the term bird brain as if to say a brain which is not very good. Actually now bird brain means slightly better than most mammals because there are a lot of mammals which can't do the things which the crows and the parrots can do. What about our domestic animals? How good are they at learning things? Uh, people will sometimes say sheep are stupid because sheep, when you frighten them, will, will run away. Uh, actually, running away from humans is a very adaptive thing to do, a sensible thing to do. But here's an example of a study which was carried out with sheep in mountains in the, in the Alps in Europe, done by a French researcher called Favre. And what Favre found was that groups of sheep moved around from one area of pasture to another, following routes which were sometimes quite long distances, and uh, they remembered the routes. And also they went back, once they had grazed in an area, they went back again to that area after it had had time to, for the pasture to grow again. They didn't go back after two days or five days, they went back after maybe two weeks or four weeks, and that varied according to the time of year. So the sheep are managing, they are, they are remembering how long it takes, uh, again a concept of time, how long it takes for the pasture to grow, and they don't go back and waste their time walking up and down these seat paths uh, until it's useful to, to, to do that. This is a comparative study here by Ron Kilgour, in, which he did in New Zealand, and he used mazes, where the animal has to get from one place to another, taking uh, a number of uh, decisions. And the mazes were of different sizes for different species. And he measured 
the speed of learning. And the significant differences which he found was that five-year-old children were better than the uh, domestic animals which he looked at. And then after that, there were cows, pigs, sheep, and goats, and they were significantly better than dogs, which were significantly better than horses, and then cats and rats and hens and pigeons. And if you looked instead of the speed of learning at the number of errors, then uh, the number of errors which was made was followed the same kind of pattern, except the dogs did a little bit better when it came to numbers of errors, but the children were still very good. So we can feel very happy that children, that uh, humans are, are good at doing these things. Um, but it was particularly interesting that these domestic animals, especially the farm animals, uh, were very good at learning these tasks. Here is a study which is done by uh, my former colleague, Keith Kendrick in Cambridge. And what he did was to rec record from the brain of a sheep. And when the sheep uh, saw a picture, uh, there was activity in the cells of, of, of in certain cells in the brain. Uh, for example, uh, when he showed uh, pictures of sheep with horns, there were cells which responded to sheep with horns. Uh, if they saw another species or if they saw a sheep without horns, uh, then they didn't respond. And if it was a, a drawing of a sheep, if it had horns, they would respond to that as well. So that was one unit in the brain. Another unit in the brain responded to a particular individual. Uh, so it didn't respond to a pattern, didn't respond to a goat. It didn't respond to a, one sheep with horns, but it did respond to another sheep with horns. So this was a unit in the brain which was responding to a particular individual sheep. And sheep were able to, in another part of his study, to discriminate photographs, discriminate between individual sheep. And uh, they then when they were tested again a year later, they were still able to do that. So they remembered how to do it for a year. Uh, we also know, of course, that the, the ewes, the females, recognize their own lambs. And we know that there is activation of the emotion controlling areas of the brain when a ewe is recognizing a lamb. Uh, another set, and some other studies on sheep which were done recognizing the state of an individual, some of them done by my former PhD student, Kevin Ellicker. He, he, was, he found that sheep could distinguish between the faces of, uh, of other sheep, between an alarmed face and a calm face. The sheep didn't have a preference for them. The sheep, it was clear that the, the sheep knew they were looking at a, uh, a photograph, they didn't, and the, the, but they could, if they were given a food reward for one of the kinds of face, an alarm face or a calm face, they could learn to distinguish between them. Uh, another study done recently by uh, my colleague Jenny Morton, uh, sheep were trained to respond to pictures of people. So they could distinguish a picture of Barack Obama from a, a picture of somebody else or a picture of the actress Emma Watson from somebody else. So they could respond, they could identify individual humans from their photographs. They also could respond to information from other sheep. One of the areas of, of, of study of cognitive ability is to see whether individual animals can identify what is in a mirror. When an individual looks in a mirror, do they know what they can see in the mirror? Uh, we did a study with pigs, and what we did in this case was we had put the pig in a small pen down in the right, bottom right-hand side, and then the pig could see a mirror, and there was a barrier, and behind the barrier was a food bowl. Uh, and the uh, when when and the, when the pig, which was in the pen, was re it recognized the food bowl as a food bowl. And when it was released and allowed to go and search, if they had never seen a mirror before, what most of them did was to go behind the mirror to look where at the apparent position of the food bowl. However. If they were given five hours of experience in an hour, and an hour, and this picture showed one pig, but it was done with two pigs at the same time, they did spend time looking at the mirror, moving in front of it, and observing the change in the image in the mirror. And after the five hours, these pigs put in the same experimental situation, uh, 
looked at the uh, looked at the image of the of the food bowl uh, in the mirror and went uh, away, away from. I'll go back. Doctor Donald. Yes. Could you please set again the peak experiment? Yes. So with uh, the mirror, because maybe it's a new interference with the audio. Okay, I say it again. Please. So the, the, Thank you. The, so the experiment, the, first of all, they took a pig which had never seen a mirror. They put the pig in a pen so that it could look at uh, a mirror and there was a solid barrier. And behind that, there was a food bowl, which, was, which they recognized as a food bowl. So they could see the food bowl in the mirror. Now, when they had never seen a mirror before, if you release the pig from the then the pig would go behind the mirror and look. Dr. Donald? Yes. Sorry. Maybe if you put a little less close to your headphones, I believe maybe your audio is too loud. Making, I don't know if too loud or maybe you are too close to the microphone. Okay, I'm talking a little quietly. So, yeah, when you if when you talk in the last sentence, there is the interference. Maybe from another lecture, but I believe you are talking like maybe too close from the microphone. I don't know if it's that. Uh, well, I okay. Uh, I will. Uh, well, I'll try to be very clear. <laughs> Thank you very much. Maybe if you could explain again about the PIX experiment, please. Yes. Thank you very much, Doctor Brown. So, a pig which had not seen a mirror before was put into a pen where it could see the reflection of a food bowl. And then the door of the pen was opened and the pig went towards the mirror and then walked behind the mirror, uh, which is where the uh, image appears to be. So this is what the pig did if it had never seen a mirror before. <laughs> if, if the pig was given five hours of experience with a mirror, then when they went, uh, when they went, when they were put again in the uh, uh, in the pen, or when they they're, they're put in the same study, the same experiment, what they did was they went away from the mirror, around the barrier, and went to the food bowl. In other words, they were using the information from the mirror after only five hours of experience with a mirror. So each pig must have observed features of its surroundings, remember these, remember their own actions, uh, deduce the relationships between what they could see and what they remembered and acted accordingly. So this is quite, this, this is a very clever thing to do. And in fact, this uh, study which we did was replicated for a BBC television program. Studies in which, <coughs> Uh, studies in which information from a mirror or from a video has been demonstrated is just for only a few species has this been done. So for humans, chimpanzees, capuchin monkeys, dolphins, pigs, elephant, a parrot and magpies, just a small number of species have been shown to be able to learn what is in a mirror. Uh, then this is a, another different kind of study, this time with young, young cows. Um, and what is done here is the cow is put into a place where it, uh, it has a gate in front of it and it can see uh, food. And, the, and the, the, so the food is, is uh, it, uh, ahead of it, but it can't get to it. But if it puts its nose in the hole in the wall, then the gate will open. So it, it, uh, and what happens is that the young cow learns, if I put my nose in the hole in the wall, then the gate will open and I can go and get the food. 
And then there is a control in animal, which has the same get uh, has the gate opening at the same time, but it's not uh, a consequence of the actions of the cow. So the first animal learns, I have to do this to make the gate open. The second animal gets the same reward. And what happened was that the one which had learned, just after it had learned, it showed an excited response. The excited response was an increase in heart rate, an increase in uh, it jumped in the air, uh, it sometimes um, made vocalizations and showed an excited response. So they were aware of having uh, been successful in solving a problem and they showed a response to the achievement. And there's been a similar kind of study now done with dogs and dogs were also, also did this. They showed a, uh, an achievement a response to their own achievement, which we refer to as the Eureka effect. I just, I'll give you um, one more example of, uh, of learning. And this is, a, one, this is a study with fish. And this study is done with a, a fish, which is a, called a wrasse. And these wrasse live on coral reefs and they clean parasites from bigger fish. And what happens is that they go to a particular place on the coral reef and the big fish want to have the parasites cleaned. So they wait in a queue, in a, a, a row for it to be cleaned. And what sometimes happens is that a, an individual which doesn't understand the rules comes in uh, and uh, doesn't wait in the queue. And the, uh, the, the fish, the cleaner fish will clean that one first because otherwise it will go away. And this, this situation was mimicked experimentally by giving a fish, uh, by giving, and this can be done with any kind of animal, giving a fish uh, preferred food, some permanently available and some which was removed if it was not selected. So it's ephemeral, uh, ephemeral food. It goes away if you don't take it. So can they learn to take the food which is going to go away if you don't take it before the food which is permanently there? And the answer is that the, the, these wrasse, these fish were able to learn this within 10 trials. The same kind of study was done with some uh, primates and the monkeys and apes took 50 to 100 trials and sometimes they were not successful. They also, the study was also done with African gray parrots. And the parrots learned also within 10 trials. So we have a situation where this particular task was done better by the fish and by the parrot than by the primates, the monkeys and the, and the apes. So this is starting to make people wonder, well, how clever are these different animals? Another group of animals where there's been a lot of work on, on what they can learn are the cephalopods, that is octopus, cuttlefish and squid. They have been found to be able to modify previous learning, to learn how to go through mazes, to use flexible route planning. They have individual differences. Um, they can show simultaneous different responses uh, to other individuals on the two sides of the body, something which humans of course can't do. They can use tools, they can carry out behavior that leads to deception. So these are very complex cognitive abilities which these animals show. And there are also some complex things which are shown by some decapod crustacea like lobsters and crabs. Um, hermit crabs compete for shells and they remember which shells they've investigated. Crabs can show avoidance learning. Um, spiny lobsters can navigate home even when displaced between 12 and 37 kilometers across the seabed. They find their way back again to where they came from. And also these animals have, uh, there is evidence that they have a pain system. So with prawns, when the antennae were treated with acid, they increased cleaning after the acid unless an anesthetic was used. Um, crabs would avoid a shelter where they had received painful electric shocks. Uh, hermit crabs would trade off a, a preference for something positive and the experience of shock. So pain systems, and I haven't had time to go into this in detail, but there is very clear evidence for pain systems in all farm animals. 
And sometimes people have said, well, cows don't have as much sensitivity to pain because they have thicker skin. But actually, if you watch cows, you can see that they will respond to an individual mosquito biting them. So they clearly can feel that and will respond to that. So we have a situation with uh, research on pain systems that all mammals, birds and fish that have been tested, there is good evidence for a pain system, also in crabs and prawns and some evidence in these uh, uh, cephalopod mollusks as well. So the present view of people, research scientists who are asked to evaluate sentience is that all vertebrate animals, so mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, and fish, and also cephalopods and decapod crustacea are regarded as sentient animals, and some others may be. Some other invertebrates may be. We know that honeybees and ants are able to form cognitive maps and they can count while they are searching for food. Cockroaches can show place learning. Jumping spiders can have, show sophisticated cognitive ability. They can look at a maze and then work out where to go in the maze after they've moved out of sight of it and, and been put at the front of the actual maze. Uh, and there are a number of other uh, examples uh, with spiders of sh showing sophisticated cognitive functioning. And we know quite a lot of other mollusks have uh, pain systems quite similar to ours because we use them as human pain models. We don't have very good evidence for pain in insects and spiders. Okay, so, so these are some of the things which are saying that these animals are much more complex than we think. But what is actually special about humans? This is a list of things which humans are, have been said, it has been said, humans can do this, nothing else can do it. Using tools, using language, having emotions and feelings, having morality, a concept of time, being able to predict the future, showing deception, showing empathy, having a concept of an object when it is not visible, uh, using complex reasoning. Actually, everything in that list has been demonstrated at, in at least some non-human animals. So none of these things, it depends how you define them, but uh, none of these things is exclusive to humans. It's very difficult, in fact, to find something which humans can do, which other species can't do at all. Uh, on, on the other hand, humans are capable of destroying the world and maybe others are not doing that. So how does this idea of sentience affect which animals to protect? I think we should think about the welfare of all living animals. Welfare is a term which applies to all animals. Um, and actually having less cognitive ability might mean that problems are worse than if you have uh, uh, enough brain function to be able to evaluate it very accurately. Um, on the other hand, more awareness could also be more potential for mental anguish. What about what other values of different kinds of animals? What, how do you personally value different kinds of animals? Uh, should we give more value to sentient animals? Or should we say that large animals or small animals or beautiful animals or rare animals are more valuable? Um, or should we uh, not categorize animals in any of these ways? If we're going to protect animals, then what we do to protect them would depend on their abilities, wouldn't it? So you, you need to perhaps think about using a, a, a pain prevention, anesthetics and analgesics, if the animals definitely have a pain system. But you don't need to do that if they don't have a pain system. And at the end of all of these issues and saying what humans can do and what other animals can do, there is the question of who are we? If you use the word we, sometimes perhaps the word we should include more than just humans. It should include all sentient animals or some other sentient animals. So the general conclusions then from all of this, firstly, the welfare of animals, including the welfare of humans can be assessed scientifically. Um, welfare refers to all animals, but many people are more concerned to protect animals which are sentient. Uh, welfare is a key part of sustainability, so we are 
thinking about it in relation to all sorts of products. Um, we ought to take account of all the components of sustainability, welfare being just one of them. Um, so human values have been changing and with new knowledge, values need to change a bit faster than they are at present. And this is one of the revolutions in the world. And then finally, these are some of the books which I've written about this area. Okay, so thank you very much. I hope you could follow what I was saying. Thank you, Dan, for your presentation. Um, and um, uh, can, can you... Um, Yes, and um, can you share your, your camera with us just to see you, <laughs> yes, see your face? Uh, yes, it won't let me do that. Oh, you're not allowed, you, you're not allowed to do it? Uh, it? Maybe. It says you're not allowed to do it. Oh. Wait a minute, I'll try again, video. Jair? Can you shut? Can I start my video? Estoy viéndolo, Alicia. Gracias. Well, Wait a moment, I... please, Dr. Broom. Well, in the meantime, um, I will I will gather some questions. Do you have time for one or two questions, Don? Yes, yes, fine. Oh, no, I think I stopped sharing. Okay, yep. I did. Yes. Okay. Right, start video. No, it doesn't allow me. Okay. Well, uh, in the meantime, um, I will. I can I will, hear. Yes, yes I, I will. I will um, speak in Spanish with, with the with the questions, and yes. Andrea Andrea will translate for you. Okay. Yes. Bueno, muchas gracias por la presentación, Don, y eh, vamos a hacer un un par de preguntas de las que están acá en el en el chat. Eh, hay una pregunta eh, que, que, que... Hernán. Que, sí. Un segundo. Las preguntas están en la sección preguntas sí. y respuestas. Esas son la prioridad. Sí, Las otras sí. personas que han hecho preguntas, mm -hmm. hubo una persona, Natalia Carrillo, que hizo una pregunta en inglés. Is there evidence? Le pido por favor que ponga la misma pregunta en español, porque las preguntas se están haciendo en español y me imagino que eres de habla hispana. Si no, me lo puedes comentar y lo hacemos de la misma manera. Yo lo puedo traducir. Y en el caso de Edilberto Brito, te agradecería mucho que hagas tu pregunta, por favor, por la sección de preguntas y respuestas. Muchas gracias. Puedes partir, Hernán. Gracias, Camila. Sí, aquí estoy viendo la, la sección de preguntas y respuestas. Y una primera pregunta que, que, que es bastante buena es, eh, dice... Yeah, I, I understand the question, yes. <laughs> dice relación con well, los... I can answer that question. <laughs> um, which, which one would you like to, to answer, Don? The, the first one, which was, our, is there evidence of sentience in Kned area? Uh, okay. So I, uh, I can answer that. that at, at the moment, the answer is no. That we we don't we the, these are the these are the uh, the jellyfish and the sea anemones and at the moment there is there is is no evidence there is no really evidence of uh, a really functioning pain system and most of the uh, cognitive ability is a rather low level in these animals and so I would say no at the moment we don't have evidence for sentience in those animals. Gracias, Tom. Hay otra pregunta bastante similar o por el mismo estilo. Eh, ¿Los insectos son sintientes? Hay una pregunta ahí. So uh, we have, we do have good evidence uh, for a cognitive uh, ability, which is quite good in ants and bees and some other uh, insects, but we don't have very good evidence for there being a, 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 a high level pain system in insects. So at, at the moment, uh, they are not included. In contrast to the, in contrast to the uh, decapod crustaceans, the crabs and the prawns, uh, the evidence there is good that they have a pain system, but in insects, I would say at the moment, we don't have much evidence for that or of other feelings in insects. Gracias, Tom. Eh, otra pregunta eh, que dice así, muchos utilizan la sentencia 
conciencia e inteligencia para evitar el uso de animales para nuestro beneficio. Por ejemplo, el león es sintiente y caza una gacela que también es sintiente. ¿Por qué se cuestiona cuando un ser humano que es eh, sintiente, por ejemplo, come un animal o usa un animal en investigación? ¿Cómo se puede responder a un animalista, un prote proteccionista que usa este argumento? Yes. So I, I think that uh, this is a question about morality. Uh, is it immoral for a lion to capture uh, another kind of mammal, for example? And I, I, I don't think that it is. I think that is uh, something which happens. Uh, uh, and but the question is, what is the uh, what should humans do? And I think that that, that humans are in fact also adapted for consuming other animals in the same way that are not in the same level, but as, as, as a lion is. So I, I think that uh, these things are, the different people are going to come to different decisions about what is morally right and what is not morally right about consuming uh, other animals. And I, I would say there are three aspects to that. Uh, one is, Sometimes, sorry, can you do the translation? Is it all right or shall I stop? Okay, okay. Right, so if, if you say, should, should we eat other animals? Some people would say, I cannot bring myself to eat something, eat, eat an animal which was once alive. And in that case, I think that person will go on in that way and that's their choice. And other people might say, uh, we ought to eat plants rather than animals because it is more efficient in using world resources. And in that case, I would say, uh, yes, but there are animals, which, we have animals which are eating leaves and we are not able to uh, digest those. So for 42% of the Earth's surface is that it's not suitable for arable crop production uh, and therefore the best way to use that if humans are going to use it is to have herbivorous animals like ruminants or herbivorous fish or insects <laughs> and then, uh, uh, could eat those animals and uh, so in terms of using uh, in terms of efficiency then uh, i think that the probably to continue to eat animals. It uh, doesn't mean everybody has to, but I think we probably, as, uh, in total, we need to. And then a, 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 a third point is people will say, I don't think we should kill animals in order to produce human food. But actually, there is no kind of plant production which does not involve killing animals. So whenever you plant crops, you're going to kill animals. In, 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 to some extent, at least, it varies from crop to crop. So, uh, not if if you say I can't, I can't, I can't allow you to kill animals, then you can't have plants. So then there's no food of any kind. Thank you. Donald, yes, Doctor yes. Donald, could you please not be so close to your microphone? <laughs> Sorry <laughs> again, but when you made it the third time with the pig, it was perfect. So that way is perfect. Please. Okay, I will. Thank you. <laughs> gracias, gracias, Don. Yo creo que tenemos una pregunta más que es interesante, yo creo, de, de hacer. Es de Patricio, que, que dice, ¿cómo piensa usted que debe ser la estrategia a fin que la legislación en la protección de animales no humanos se corresponda con la ciencia? Y yo le agregaría un, algo más eh, sobre tu experiencia en, 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 en otros países, ¿cómo se ha implementado eh, el tema de la sintiencia en la legislación en otros países? Dado que en Chile justamente estamos en un proceso de transformación eh, con una nueva constitución donde eh, 
eh, está incluida en el, en el, en el borrador, eh, incluir a la sentencia animal yes. como okay. parte de... So I would, uh, uh, one, one thing which, so in the, in the, uh, in the European Union and other countries which say the animals which we use are sentient beings, then what that means is that you should not do things which are going to cause a lot of suffering to those animals. You should, you should avoid doing things which are, which are, which are going to cause suffering. And that uh, would include actions which cause pain actions which cause a lot of fear, uh, keeping them in conditions which do, do not meet their needs. And so the legislation is mostly uh, designed to try to say how, do, first of all, we find out what the animals need, and then we try to avoid doing the things which cause su substantial uh, damage, substantial suffering to the animals. And that includes particularly housing systems and methods of transport, and methods of killing animals. Uh, and so the, the, the sentient animals are, are, have more possibilities for suffering than an animal which is not sentient. So, uh, and all of, the, all of the animals which we, we use uh, as farm animals, except possibly bees are, uh, are sentient animals all the animals with most of the animals which we use as companion animals or working animals uh, are, are, are sentient. So the, and it also now is starting to take more account of wild animals. So people are, uh, are feeling more uncomfortable about the treatment of, of wild animals. So if we are going to kill, for example, if you're going to kill wild animals, you should try to kill them in a way which is humane and you should not cause the deaths of animals with, with, for no purpose at all. So uh, that means maybe you change some of your methods of fishing, for example. If you, are, if you are fishing in a way which kills very large numbers of animals in addition to the ones you're trying to catch, then that is being, starting to be considered as morally wrong. And so there are some changes Uh, it, but the laws are usually aimed at saying you need to provide for the needs of the animals and you need to avoid doing things which cause a lot of suffering. Gracias, Don. Eh, bueno, quedaron muchas preguntas eh, sin, sin, ahí, sin responder, pero dado el tiempo que tenemos y sobre todo pensando eh, en, en Don, que allá en Inglaterra es un poco tarde, Queremos dejar esta reunión, esta charla acá. Eh, nuevamente agradecer a Don por su, por su presentación y vamos a dejar a Camila Palma, a la doctora Palma, para que eh, dé las palabras de, eh, de, de finalización de esta, de esta charla. Solamente quiero eh, nuevamente agradecer a Don. Thank you, Don, for your talk once again, um, and I hope to see you soon, hopefully in September. Okay, thank you very much for your kind words and thank you for the very interesting questions. Thank you, Dr. Donald. We really appreciate the wisdom and knowledge you just shared with us, including the effort by the time difference you have right now. We know it's six hours more than us, so thank you very much. And thank you also to all the participants in this chat. We hope to see you again in the next month. So you can go and rest. Thank you very much for this seminar. Okay, and thank you uh, very much for the translation. Thank you, Hernán Cañón, que hizo toda la gestión eh, como un poco hijo <ríe> postizo del doctor <Yeah>. Broom. <ríe> like a grandson, I believe. <ríe> so thank you very much. Thank you, Alicia Plaza, for all the presentation and to the Consejo Metropolitano del de Colegio Médico Veterinario de Bienestar Animal de Chile.
Colegio Médico Veterinario, importante decirlo. <ríe> Muchas gracias a todos por participar. Muchas gracias a todos, eh, que tengan una muy buena tarde. No se olviden, esta charla quedó grabada, así que va a estar disponible para quienes quieran escucharla nuevamente. Vamos a tratar en breve a que podamos tener los subtítulos, ya que la charla va a quedar, eh, gra quedó grabada en el idioma de origen, digamos en inglés. Así que agradecemos enormemente la gran audiencia que tuvimos hoy y esperamos que este tipo de charlas con esta calidad de, de expositores se repitan nuevamente, no dudamos de aquello. Agradecemos al doctor Brum por su presencia, por estar acá a esta hora de la noche, para madrugada realmente para él. Y agradecemos a todos los que, a todo el equipo de la Comisión de Bienestar Animal del Consejo Regional Metropolitano que hicieron que esto fuera posible. A cada uno de ustedes. Muchas gracias, muchas gracias a Andrea Cayosi por su excelente interpretación y nos vemos en una próxima oportunidad. Estén atentos a las redes que nuevamente seguimos con una serie de charlas muy interesantes, todas relacionadas, por cierto, con bienestar animal en este caso de esta comisión. Que estén muy bien, muy buenas noches a todos. Muchas, muchas gracias.